Wednesday's child is full of woe, goes the old English poem. This Wednesday's child may be full of woe, but woe must have really resisted the addition of resilience, hope, faith, love, and all of its cousins. Because today, y'all, this Wednesday's child is 50. Do you hear me? 50. Remember when 50 was old? Guess what? Not, not so much. Welcome to a very special episode of the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. It is Wednesday, December 1st. This is our 50th episode. Randomly scheduled to drop on a Wednesday that happens to be my 50th birthday, and I happen to have been born on a Wednesday. I don't believe the old English poem, and I smile when I think about baby Amy, true to form, waiting for hump day to make my grand entrance. You're in for a treat today, as I have asked one person from each decade of my life to share just a few minutes with me. These are people that know it all. They've been there through it all at some point in my life. All of the trauma, all of the pain, and still to this day, in some form, still walk with me as I navigate PTSD and all of its friends. Selfishly, I wanted this on audio, so this podcast, in some ways, is a birthday present to myself. Enjoy this episode as I celebrate 50 trips around the brightest star in the universe. May the true star of all 50 be glorified, because on this day, more than any other, my simple prayer is this. Sir, we would see Jesus. I am honored today to introduce you to some people that God has used. I could have picked so many people, but we only have a short time. It is my prayer that you will find hope and healing in what you hear today. One of the things that I am reminded of is the scripture in the Bible, and it's found in, I believe, all four Gospels, but it's the parable of the seed, where Jesus is talking about how some seeds some people are, are, are used to plant the seed. Some people are used to maintain the seed, work the field, work the harvest, and then somebody gets to reap those seeds. And so today, one person from each decade of my life, the very first person being the person that dropped some of the very first seeds, and will walk through each decade of my life and how all of the seeds are now we're able to reap the harvest of everything that was invested in me. So I, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. It is going to be so much fun, and I can't wait for you to hear from some of my favorite people in the world. And so without further ado, let's drop into these conversations. Five people, five decades, one God. Children are not to be molded, but are merely people to be unfolded. Light filtered dimly through the spider webs and dirt on the prison room windows. I had convinced Mama to let me go to church with the nice people from across town. I'd bounce out of bed, test the door to ensure that Mama unlocked it, race to get ready, and then shuffle down the stairs to wait for that old yellow school bus. Rick drove the bus, and his wife Sharon attempted to keep a bunch of kids from downtown Jacksonville, the ghetto as some would call it, who had been bribed by candy to go to church. She was just trying to keep us in order. Their young daughter sat securely in a car seat next to her dad as he drove. Week after week, when the bus pulled back in front of our house, I swallowed hard, stood a little straighter, and prepared to go back to the battlefield we called home. Rick and Sharon must have known something because they began to do something after Sunday morning church that even today gives me life when I think about it. The Bible says that many are responsible for the harvest, as I mentioned, some plant, some sow, some reap. Rick and Sharon were called to plant, and plant they did. To represent my first decade, today, Sharon is here to answer some of my questions, as well as any birthday sentiments that she may have for me. Let's drop into this conversation with my friend, Sharon Reynolds. Well, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that story with Sharon. Sharon is married and has been for a lot of years, I think 41 years, and they were the first people to plant the seed in the Amy Watson story. So it is my pleasure to introduce today to the podcast, Sharon. Sharon, thank you so much for coming on to the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. I've been so excited about this conversation. 
You're welcome. I'm a little nervous, but I'll make it. <laughs> You're a little nervous, but you'll make it. I told you we got an edit button, so no worries. Well, this is a celebration of my 50th birthday, and I simply would not... <laughs> I would not be celebrating a half century mark. You know, Sharon, when I, when I made it to 40, I was shocked. I did not have a problem with turning 40. I am struggling a little bit with turning 50 because I remember when 50 sounded old. But I would not be here today without you and your husband, Rick. And even as I prayed just a few minutes ago by proxy, little Monique, who couldn't even speak, but was the first to coin the term Mamie for me, which my own nieces and nephews call me this to this day. And so I'm so grateful just to spend a few minutes with you. And so I'm going to just jump right in. I know that I am asking you to reach way back into the annuals of uh, your memory when I ask you to do this. But what is one of your earliest, earliest memories of little Amy? Because you are in the first decade of my life. And so I was 10 years old when I first came to know you and Rick. And so t talk to us a little bit about your first memories of little Amy. I've been interested in these, in these answers so far. I'd be interested in yours. Wow, that was a while back. Um, I think the, <laughs> the first memory of you was you were a little, of course you were little, uh, blonde-headed girl, so blonde your hair was almost white. Um, but you were one of the very few kids that as the church bus pulled up, you didn't wait for us to blow the horn. You were out of, the, out, out of that front door like you'd been shot out of a cannon. <laughs> um, some Sundays I was afraid you were going to smack into the church bus door before you got it open. I'm like, here comes Amy, look out. That's so Some things never change, right? Right. And um, I could. my only thought process on that was either, wow, she really likes coming to church with us. And I always tuck this way in the back of my mind, but I was afraid to bring it to the forefront because I wasn't equipped to deal with it, was... Is there something going on that makes her want to leave? Yeah. And, you know, and get out of the house. I have since through the years honed my body reading abilities, a gift from my, my grandmother and from God mostly, that I can now tell if there's something wrong if you're not being truthful. But back then it wasn't honed as much. Yeah. If it had been, I might have been terrified. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, I imagine you were when you hear what Gail said, uh, and the listeners will hear her after you. Yeah, she was like, "We knew something was wrong, but couldn't put our finger on it." Yeah, couldn't put a finger on it, and so you, it's uh, because you were such a good actress at such a young age. We didn't realize you were already used to hiding things. Interesting, interesting, and yeah, I was so young, only ten years old. Um, that is really, really interesting. Well, let me ask you this. So because you really it's a really beautiful segue into what I wanted to ask you, too, is what was going through your mind? Because at some point you tried your you knew something was up. You didn't know what. And, and I know you well enough now to know, like you just kind of put it to the back of your mind and said, well, let us do what we can do. And the listeners heard what you and Rick did do. But what was going through your mind on those Sundays as you tried to protect me the best you could? What what made you take a chance on that little toe-headed Amy? I I don't know how to explain it, but I do know, I remember one Sunday, you were sitting in your spot on the bus next to Monique and daring anyone to bother her. Mm. And you were her fierce little protector. And that kind of endeared you in our hearts right there because, you know, if you loved our daughter and it was honest, it was a pure protective love that you're good in our book. Yeah. But one Sunday we were talking about dinner, lunch, dinner, whatever you call it. And I mentioned, did you remember the ice cream? And your radar went boing. And you said ice cream. I said, yeah, we usually have ice cream or we have a dessert. But usually it's ice cream because Mr. Rick works for an ice cream company. And you took this deep breath and went, oh, I'd love to have ice cream for dessert. I mean, you know, in a way that only a 10-year-old can that just rips your heart out. And so we got home that afternoon, and I said, I wonder if Amy's parents would let her come eat Sunday dinner with us once in a while. And so we said, well, ask her next Sunday, and she can ask her, her mom and dad, cause, and then uh, if they say, yeah, we'll just bring her home until she's tired of us. And little knowing how many Sundays I was going to say, I never, never got tired of you. <laughs> but um, I... 
you know, after each meal, you would offer to help clean up, and you always told me, you're a great cook, and I was still struggling in the kitchen because Rick was a better cook than I was, and in some ways still is, <laughs> but then, you know, we, but you knew you had to eat what was on that plate, and sometimes you would eat two plates. Wow. And I think that you would want for a third, I think you were trying to pack it in now, I realized, for the week, um, and I'd say, no, don't, don't eat any more. You've already had all, what you have to have so you can have some ice cream. And, oh, man, you could pack away that ice cream. I remember him working for the ice cream company. I have such strong memories of the ice cream. Briars, wasn't it? Or, or um... Yes, it was Briars. Yeah, it was Briars. I, re I remember the ice cream. And I was packing it in. I didn't eat until, uh, you know, and maybe this is the first time I've ever told you this, but often, uh, you know, we were lucky to get two or three meals locked in that room that you had no idea that we were locked in. And so, yeah, when I came to your house, um, I, I ate because I had food. And it's so interesting that you say that about Monique because, you know, that's still who I am today. I'm still fiercely protective of people. But I, I would just remember that little girl, and I hope that Monique will listen to this episode I want to shout her out because she was part of um, she is part of the redemption story because I just remember the hope even as a 10 year old just looking at the innocence of that little baby in that car seat sitting next to next to me on that bus and I remember thinking I will I will never let what's happening to me happen to you and so I actually remember forming that thought at, at 10 years old. Um, so, so that answers the, my question, like you took a special interest in me and, and, and it's interesting too, that you say that I helped clean up before I was even taught. And so it's so, it's so, I, I just remember too, though, after we would have those, those meals, we would take these epic naps, these Sunday naps, ones that I wish I could take to this day. But what I want to tell you too is that was the only time I could sleep when I was safe was that time between Sunday after we got done eating and we went back to church on Sunday night at your house, at yours and Rick's house was the place where I was safe when I could sleep. And and, and I hope that Lynette and Garth Piper are listening to this too, because they came in later as my youth, youth directors. And sometimes I would go to their house. But anytime I was at your house or somebody at Victory's house, my friends or Lynette and Garth, um, was the time that I probably slept the best um, on those Sundays. And I'm, I'm, I, I just, I'm so grateful, so grateful to you. As we are talking to podcast listeners out there, and this is a celebration of my birthday, and really I'm dancing with the ones that brung me. I would not be here had you guys not planted the seed of, hey, Amy, we love you, but Jesus loves you. And making and, and, and Sharon, I have such beautiful memories of sword drills. Um, I still can find just about every book in the Bible faster than just about anybody. Um, scripture memorization in the darkest times of my life, and, 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 and particularly, I'm thinking and particularly in the domestic violence portion of my life, that scripture memory that you guys, you guys, get, now you bribed us, but you guys, um, that I wanted candy or ice cream or something, which is funny because I don't have a sweet tooth now, but I just remember that the scripture memorization and the songs and the, just the love that I felt in that home. And I want to publicly thank you for that. And I'm not, I know you're, you're shy and introverted, so I won't even ask for a response on that, but I want you to hear my heart on that. And so, but I do want you to encourage those other people out there that are in churches in schools in neighborhoods, when they see somebody, a kid like me, and you get that still small voice in the back of your brain, because Gail said the same thing. She said, I I don't know what it was about you. Mom McGowan said the same thing. I don't know what it was about you, but we just bonded. Well, we know what it was about me. It wasn't about me at all. It was about a God who gave you guys a burden, who gave you guys a calling, and you actually listened to that calling. As I've mentioned in the podcast with when I was on uh, with Mom McGowan, which listeners will hear after you, is you were the epitome of the Isaiah 6, 9, which by the way, you taught me this scripture memorization where God says to the prophet Isaiah, who will I send and who will go for me? And Isaiah said, then said I, here am I, send me. Well, I remember rem memorizing that scripture under your tutelage. And so do you have anything to people out there who, who sees a kid or somebody, it could be a domestic violence survivor or somebody actually in the thick of it? What do you say to those people who hear that still small voice that says, help that person? Give them some ice cream, whatever that version of the ice cream is. What would you have to say to them? 
Uh, one, I would say, listen to that voice. It's not a voice. It's God urging you on. It's the Holy Spirit going nudge, nudge. Yeah. And and in this day and age, sometimes it's scary to involve yourself in anything. Agreed. But I think we never know what difference that'll make in someone's life. I had no clue we were going to have this kind of influence in your life. None whatsoever. But at the same time, it's like little things you read on the internet and you hear from time to time. Be kind to that person. You don't know what they're going through. Right. That one smile, that hug, that word of encouragement might be what keeps them from harming themselves that day or may give them the courage to go to the next step yeah. in winning their freedom from whatever situation they're in. And we both know there's just so many situations in this world that can capture you and, and hold you. That's so but, true. And had you guys not done that, had you held all of those things close to, to your, you know what I'm saying? Like, had you, had you said, that's too messy. I don't want to be involved in that. And, and, well, e and even Gail said, who is on after you, even Gail said, we just didn't have a clue. And you just said it too. Like you were already amazing at, at hiding what was going on, which is, which is really enlightening to me as I continue to, to w do this work. But, but yes, listen to those voices. Don't ignore them. If it's ice cream, a cup of coffee, sitting by them in church, you know, a nice little text message, a check-in, anything, you never know when you're somebody's lifeline and you never know. I, Sharon, I don't claim to anything of fame, whatever happens as a result of this podcast or anything I've ever written or anytime I ever have gotten or will get behind another microphone or a podium or a keyboard will happen because Rick and Sharon Reynolds planted the seed. And, and I talk about the parable of the seed uh, as Jesus talks about in all four gospels and you guys planted it and other people came along like the children's home and some people from college and, and on and on and cultivated those seeds. And to survivors out there, I want to say to you that I did have a take. I did have a role to play in this is that I received that seed. And here we are 30. Well, gosh, a lot of years later, 45 years later, 40 years later on a podcast that will be broadcast around the world. And as my doctor always says, the things that are that that I'm able to do, he said, you shouldn't be able to do that. I should I should be dead, really. And so I wanted to just thank you so much. And so as we close out, it is my birthday. This is the time and I don't give my mic to people very often. But I wanted to give you the mic just uh, I, I keep telling people this this podcast episode might just be for me because it's going to be audio gold for me to have. But do you have anything you would like to share on my birthday episode? Because I am 50. That means you're, you know, 51. I'm just kidding. Uh, but but I, I want you to know how much I love and appreciate you. Rick Reynolds, I want you to know how much I love and appreciate you. Monique, I want you to know I've loved you since I, you were two years old. And to Rochelle, I didn't get to know you as much. But what a fantastic family who has made kingdom. In fact, and we, could, we don't have time, but we could talk about your parents and just kingdom advancing people who loved that little toe-headed kid who ran to the bus so much so that she almost ran into the door, which is hilarious. That's, that part does not surprise me about me. But I do want to give you the mic as it is my 50th birthday, as I'm giving to everyone, for anything that you would like to share so that I could have forever and ever. Amen. All righty. Well, first, I want to say uh, 50 is nifty. In our family, we celebrate every decade. So I'm glad you're celebrating this decade. But um, I got back in contact with you a while back. And you were going through the end of the rough time with the court system. Yeah. And you, uh, in one of your blogs, you wrote the question, who am I? I don't know who I am anymore. And I sat down after that and started writing. Little known fact, I write my feelings. Huh. And I wrote this about you. And if it's too long, I'll let you decide. No, you go but, for it, girl. All right. You have been through the fire and have come out forged as steel, yet you have the softness of a newborn skin. You have witnessed face to face the evil of man when he yields to the prince of darkness. Yet you have chosen to not let it make you hardened and uncaring towards others by yielding yourself to the king of kings. You have sunk into the abyss of darkness and acute pain created by the evil that surrounded you. 
Yet when the light of pure love was given to you by those that God sent, you fought and clawed your way into the light of a life worth living. All the while surrounded by a cloud of seen and unseen witnesses, pulling you forward and upward in both prayer and deed. You hid the evil being perpetrated on you because you were led to believe that this evil was deserved. And if you shared this pain, no one would believe you. Yet when the burden of pain caused by this evil became too great, you confessed to those who truly knew you. And then they amazed you with strength, courage, and love beyond your understanding. You turned your back on that evil from time to time, and then the evil would try to pull you back into the abyss. Yet you stand tall as a child of the Most High. Sometimes with knees knocking and gut churning, you needs must face the evil and say, Get thee hence, Satan, and cry out the name of Jesus, knowing that his power is supplied by the Father of light, love, and liberty, which causes evil to flee, for darkness cannot survive in the light. Who are you? You were Amy. You are a sister to an awesome woman who loves you like no other. You are Mamie, one of the few I trusted with my precious baby girl because you loved her with a pure, protecting love. You were Aunt Mamie to others that you love and protect with that same fierceness. You were the niece of a man who proved to you a man could be kind, tender, and loving in a way that did not cause harm. You were a cousin that with other cousins created safe, loving, and fun memories that, that to this day reside in your heart. You were Watson, entrepreneur extraordinaire. That was a mouthful. You are a friend to people who know they can count on you having their back. You are an orphan as the world sees you, yet you have a family that was forged together through fire. Most importantly, though, you are a child of the king, orphaned no more. Your family circles the earth, and through this family, God sends reminders that you are his. That is who you are. You are seen. You are worthy. And you are so loved. Happy birthday, Amy. <clears throat> All right. Thanks for making me cry. You're welcome. <laughs> wow. Oh, my word. Thank you so much for that. You've left me speechless, and that's pretty hard to do. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I just love you to death. Monique. And uh, Rick, Lynette, Garth, the ministry of Victory Baptist Church, the ministry of Victory Christian Academy, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Sharon. You're welcome. Love you, girl. Love you more. My heart felt like it was going to explode. My breathing was too fast and too shallow. I fell to the ground. The concrete semi-indoor basketball court was unaltered by my hard fall. In short order, I was in my cabin at the Bill Rice Ranch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. She refreshed the cold washcloth and returned it to my head. I felt better almost instantly, but the warm sensation I felt from the care of an adult who wanted nothing more than to help me. I was excited she was my counselor. She found her way into my heart long before that. Gail was the wife of the pastor of that same church where Rick and Sharon ensured that I was every week. I honestly don't remember my first interaction with Gail. I do have vivid memories of her pursuing me, inviting me to sit with her at church. I loved when she rested her arm on the church pew behind me. It felt like a hug, and she felt like a mom. I knew she was different, and I pursued her right back. As it would turn out, Gail and her late husband, Ray, also planted seeds, but they were there to sow them, too. As oft mentioned on this podcast, Gail was the person who was brave enough to call the authorities once there was enough evidence of abuse and neglect. Today, I'm honored to have her here as we pick up where Sharon left off. Soon enough, they didn't have to pick me up for church because for the first time in my life, I had my own bed, three meals, and was not responsible for anything else besides myself and how I acted. Not my food, not my shelter. I wasn't responsible for any adults. I have Gail to thank for that. And today I'm so honored that she would come onto the podcast and share a little bit with you of what she remembers of teenage Amy and how her family really 
is the reason why I am able to turn 50 today. I love Gail so much. I have not seen her in decades. And so I am so grateful that she agreed to come onto the podcast today to tell a little bit of her memory of those times and to wish me any happy birthday sentiments. So let's drop into this conversation with Gail. Well, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation with my friend Sharon Reynolds, who was one of the very first to plant a seed and is the reason why I can be behind a microphone and tell you about the star of the story, who is Jesus. Next up, y'all, I have been looking forward to this conversation um, more than I can really put into words, and I am so grateful. The, The people who have listened to the Wednesdays with Watson podcast have heard me mention this family many, many times. Because they they took the seed that Rick and Sharon planted, and they planted some more seeds and cultivated the ones that were already planned. And so this is Gail Dunning, uh, who I would love, not Dunning anymore, but it, I knew her as Dunning. And she and her late husband, Ray, were my pastor and his wife and their family, and uh, who took me in for about 18 months. And so if you've listened to the podcast, you know that story. If not, head back to season one. But Gail, I would love to welcome you to the podcast today. I can't pronounce your new last name, so so that we do that justice. What it, Tell us your, your new last name. Vandenberg. Vandenberg. That's not that difficult. So yes, we lost your late husband, Ray, a couple years ago. His birthday's coming up. I always remember his birthday because it was exactly one week from mine. And so I know that he is watching down from heaven, so proud of you and, and of me. Frankly, I know that he would be proud of me. And so we're just going to jump right into this. So I just have a couple questions for you. It's my birthday. You said at the beginning of the, when we started, it's your show. And so it is kind of my show. So I keep telling people, I hope everybody else enjoys this episode because this is really for me. And so it is my 50th birthday when you're listening to this episode. And I'll, I got to tell you, oh my word. right? When I made it to 40, I thought, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't, I never thought I'd make it to 40. But now 50 is like, wow, as we look over the faithfulness of God. And so, Gail, I have asked you to come in. I asked Sharon to come in and kind of represent for that first decade because I was 10 years old when they came and picked me up. While they weren't the original ones to come and invite me to church, they were the ones that cultivated that. And then, of course, I came to Victory. At first, uh, we had a pastor there, Dr. Estes, and then you and Ray came. And I can't remember when I actually first met you. And I know it's been a long time ago, and I'm asking you to reach way back, but what are some of your very first, earliest memories of a young Amy, what would have then been Bodenheimer, not Watson, but a young Amy? A shy, sweet, lonely little girl, beautiful, and blonde as can be, too thin, way too thin. You started speaking to me every service. And then one day you said, can I sit with you? And I said, sure, you can sit with us, of course. So actually, I didn't pick you, you picked me. And uh, you started sitting with us every service that you were at church. So I was lonely. We were new there and I was lonely and I felt very glad to have someone to reach out to me and be friendly to me. Wow. I think everybody first is going to be Amy was shy. Really? I keep telling people that, but nobody believes me. So here is somebody who has confirmed what I said is that I was shy. And obviously then from being malnourished and locked in rooms and all the things I do remember, and and you'll you'll get a gift from me on this episode because I told a story at the beginning that you'll hear when the episode drops. But one of the things I said in that story was how much it meant to me when I would sit with you guys at church and you would put your arm on the pew behind me and um, you knew what, how, you knew how far you could go and how far you couldn't. And so sometimes you would cup your arm a little bit about, around my shoulder, and I remember my body almost physically reacting to that. And then you would move your hand back a little bit, but it still felt so much like a hug to me. And I just remember gravitating towards you because you cared you about hugs, me. hugs, eventually, not at first. Right. And I'm still not a huge hugger, but, but I'd love to have one from you right now. I'm not going to lie. 
February. <laughs> That's right. That's February. You're coming to Florida. Yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you, and I, I didn't realize that. I know that being, you know, I'm one of my best friends as a pastor's wife. I, I tend to kind of gravitate to pastor's families for some reason. I have a couple friends that are pastor's wives, and I tend to gravitate to them. I'm not sure why. So it, it doesn't, doesn't surprise me that I came to you. And it's interesting because I was about... 10 or 11 when you and Ray came to victory. And so some significant trauma had happened up until that point. And so I was looking for somebody to love. And I just remember feeling very loved by you from a maternal standpoint. But you guys were new there. You had three kids of your own competing for your attention. And you just said, I chose you. And fair enough at the beginning. But at some point, you chose to continue to invest in me. And the story that I told that you'll hear when the episode drops was at the Bill Rice Ranch, a very vivid memory I have at the Bill Rice Ranch. You were my camp counselor there. But so oh, even, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was such a precious memory. I felt so loved and safe and fed, but you still decided. So even though young toe-headed Amy came to you and pursued you, and what a blessing that is to my heart to hear that, you know, you were feeling lonely. And so this gave you some something that that's that's so cool and it really is a testament to we are who we are it's something i would do today is come up to people and 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 talk to them but you still chose to invest in me and lots of people listen to this podcast are in ministry and they don't know what to do with situations like mine hurting children but what made you keep choosing me well my mom and dad taught us from very young that everybody needed to be loved and everybody needed to be drawn into not only the love of Christ, but the love of people, Um, godly people loving godly people, or even godly people loving ungodly people. And that's why we chose, that's why I chose to continue loving you. Do you want me to tell the story of how you actually came to live with us? Yeah, I do, because that would have been my next question. So one night I came to church okay. and told you some things, and I really want to hear your version of this, because I only remember okay. very traumatically my version of it. So I know I came to church and told you some things, and for the sake of the podcast and to keep it PG, I don't, we're not going to say what I told you. But yes, I'd love to hear the story of how I came to live with you and Ray and David and Tim and Rachel. Okay. Okay, here we go. One Sunday evening, you came in and you had a large um, paper grocery bag with you. And the top was folded, closed. And uh, you came in and you sat down and you put the paper bag under the pew. And um, by that time, sometimes you were sitting next to Rachel and sometimes you were sitting between us. And anyway, I leaned forward and I said, what's in the bag, Amy? And uh, you said, everything I need. I said, okay, what do you mean everything you need? And you said, well, I'm not going back to that house. And um, I have everything that I need for the next couple of days. I said, well, where are you going? Are you going to go spend the night with somebody? And you said, I don't, I don't know where I'm going to go, but I know I'm not going back home. I said, what's going on? And you said, bad things are happening to me there. And I'm just not going back to that house. And um, I was alarmed. I jumped up. I ran up to the, well, I didn't run, but I walked up to the platform And I said, Ray, something's going on with Amy. And I don't know what it is, but I think I need to take her out of the service before it starts so that I can talk with her and find out what's going on. And um, he said, okay. He said, but I want you to have somebody with you that knows her better than you do because you don't know her that well. And I said, okay, who do you suggest? And um, he, he thought for a few minutes and then he said, I think Mary Lou should be the one that would go with you and Amy. And so I, I went over and Mary Lou's daughter was there and she wanted to come too, 
but I felt like it needed to just be me, you, and Mary Lou. So Mary Lou and I and you, we went to a little room at the back, you know, at behind the pulpit area, there were some little rooms in that hall. And we went to that little room and we sat at a table and um, I, I said, what's going on? And you wouldn't go into a lot of graphic detail. You just said there was a man that was living at your mom's house and he was doing things to you that you that you thought were wrong and that you did not want him to do to you. I felt like we needed to, that this was sexual abuse and that we needed to do something more drastic. And so I went back out and the song service had already started, but I went ahead and got um, Ray to step down from the pulpit for a second while I said, this sounds like sexual abuse to me. And he said, well, it sounds like we need to call CPS. And so uh, he, he motioned to Gary and asked Gary to come and go with me. So Gary and Mary Lou and you and I, we called CPS and we let you do most of the talking. We sat there listening. Um, and then when the CPS officer had a question for the adults, we would answer. Then af after we spoke to them, they said, we agree she should not be going back to that home because it could become drastic. And uh, in my mind, I'm thinking it's drastic enough already. In any case, um, the CPS officer said, do not take her home with you tonight, Mrs. Dunning. She needs to go someplace where her mom does not know where she's at or anything she needs to go to someone someone else and so Mary Lou said that she could take you home with her for the night or for the next two nights however long needed so that night you went home with uh, Mary Lou and uh, the next day you even came to school the next day and after school well not I think probably in the in the afternoon, CPS called and asked if we could come and bring you to an office in downtown Jacksonville, and we said yes. And so we took you out of school. We told the other children to just go to the their dad's office and wait till we got back. We went to downtown Jacksonville to the CPS officer office and um, met with a CPS official, um, a couple of representatives and a couple of legal aides. And they talked with you and they asked if you could come and stay with us. And I, we, Ray and I both said yes. And um, we were not, we were living in that little house. I don't know if you remember. On Bassett Road, yeah. We were living in that little house. And so you and Rachel had to share a bedroom. And somehow, somewhere, we got an extra bed to put in there. And uh, so from that point on, you um, stayed with us until they told us, okay, um, next Toward the end of the week, you're going to be um, called in to meet with um, the judge. And so we just thought, okay, we'll meet with the judge. Come to find out, it wasn't that at all. It was an actual court. And the court had called your mother and asked your mother to come to court that day. And um, so... We had planned a three-day family getaway. And so we packed up all our stuff and the kids, and we packed up you. You had all of your belongings that you could, um, that you had with you. And so we just, we didn't know what was going to happen. So we were prepared for the worst. 
in any case, we went to Jacksonville Court, and the kids and I stayed out in outside and waited at the car, and you and Ray went inside into the meeting and um, met with the judge, and it wasn't just the judge, it was court, and um, they went in, and you sat up with the... Um, the legal advisor and the judge asked you a few questions and you answered. And then he asked Ray to stand and Ray stood. And um, he didn't even call Ray by the right name. He called him a totally different name, but he meant Ray. So Ray stood and the judge said, um, you are the pastor of um, this church. And Ray said, yes. And, raised, and he said, and you've known this child for uh, a, a while. And Ray said, yes. And I, he said, and I've known about her, her circumstances for a while, too. He didn't mean the sexual abuse, but he meant that you were from a very poor family. And so the judge said, well, in this case, I remand um, this child, Amy Bodenheimer, to the care of you and your wife. And that was that. Wow. And, and I remember that was after, that I, that court day had to have been after, like, remember she agreed to take me back, or to get rid of the man, and you guys took me back to the house, and then there was a, a note on the door where she said, gone to get married, mom. And so, I remember that court hearing after that, and I remember the judge signing away my mom's parental yeah. rights. But that story is so precious that you told to me because I don't remember most of that. It was so traumatic, and 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 so, so so I lived with you guys for eighteen months. Um, and during those eighteen months, I that was the first time I had my own bed. That was um, the first birthday. I remember the birthday that I spent with you guys. You guys bought me this pink bike, and that, that bike was like the thing, right? It was, it was everything to me. Um, I remember you and I taking walks around the neighborhood because we moved from that smaller house to a bigger house out kind of yeah. a little bit separated. I had a pool. and a Yeah, I, I remember Ray getting donuts every Wednesday night after church and every Thursday. I remember the first time I ever ate wheat germ was because you made me. And so I settled in nicely, and my counselor often says those things shouldn't be able to happen, but I felt very loved. But certainly, and, and I've mentioned it many times on this podcast, when a child has that much trauma, there is some attention-seeking behavior, and I had a bunch of it, and I needed some help. And so there came a time when you guys had the, made the very difficult decision to place me in Faith Children's Home in Tampa, Florida, for which I will always be incredibly grateful because... Jacksonville, in and of itself, even to this day, Gail, holds nothing, really nothing, very, very few good memories for me. And so to get me out of Jacksonville was so smart, and to get me into the children's home was also so wise because they were equipped, as they could be, to handle stories like mine. But I've always wondered what that felt like for you. What was that decision like for you? Before we go there, can I tell you a little more? Sure. Yes, go ahead. Do you remember the day that you, my mother, and I went to your former home to get whatever belongings that you wanted? I do, and I remember it all being gone. And it was heartbreaking to me and my mother to see you walking around in that place looking and saying I, I had this I I wanted this it was my dad's and I wanted this and and it wasn't there yeah and and I remember how heartbroken you were about that and it just it just broke my heart and it made us want to try to give you everything that had been taken away as far as the decision you, the court had said that it was required for you to see a child a psychologist for several sessions. And so we did our best to find a Christian psychologist because we did not believe it would be in your best 
interest to have a secular one because they would not understand what our faith was. In any case, you saw a wonderful man who um, I feel like helped you. I agree. I remember him. I'm, I'm trying to remember his name, Dr. Late Lay something, begun with an L. Yeah, I remember that much also. Yeah. In any case, after so many months, so many sessions, um, he asked to see Ray and I alone. And so we went in to see him, and he said, I love Amy. My heart breaks for her circumstances, but I've done all that I can do. And he said, I need to tell you and Ray that you are not equipped mm. to help her. You are not equipped to deal with what she has gone through, and she needs more structure and more help than what you can give her considering you're a pastor and you both are working he said this is not going to work she needs every day all day focused attention so we didn't know what to do we prayed i cried mm -hmm. he probably cried with me but we would sit i would sit on the end of the bed and just sob because I felt like a failure, and it was so difficult for me to accept the fact that I had done all that I could do, but it wasn't enough. So we started looking. We started asking questions. We talked to other foster parents. We just searched out every avenue that we could, and uh, finally, Dr. Estes said, you know, I think Amy needs to go to uh, the children's home that we support. They are prepared to help someone in her situation. They have several that have gone through this. Uh, they have focused attention and they have people that are trained and she will get that all day one-on-one -on -one attention that she desperately needs. So after many tears, and much searching and prayer, we reached out to the children's home and they, at first they weren't sure they had room. And so we just, we prayed and waited and prayed and waited. And, and then one night um, they called and said, we have a space and she come this next week. And we, I mean, I was like, oh my, that's too fast. I'm not prepared. I don't know that she's prepared. I don't know if this is the best thing, but we decided that for your welfare, for your maturing spiritually as well as physically and mentally and emotionally, we needed to do it. So we went ahead and we got you ready and Ray took you down. I had to stay home with the kids, but Ray took you down to the, the, the home. And the whole time he was gone, I was just a basket of tears. But anyway, wow. you were gone. I was gone, but I wasn't. We got to bring you home once a month, or if we couldn't bring you home, we got to go down and visit you once a month. Yeah, so and, and I have to tell you that some of the the life um, lessons that I have that I learned in those early years were on those trips when it was just you and me rushing back from from church to Tampa, and looking at it, Gail, from a fifty year old standpoint, and you weren't even forty at this point. I think that we need to highlight that, right? You weren't even forty right. at this point, and so looking at that decision from my lens now as an adult who has had. Uh, not official foster children in my home, but ha has has had people that have lived in my home for a short while, and just being and my own stepson, who I sent actually to the children's home, who unfortunately died of a drug overdose a little over two years ago, and so now I know how it felt like for you, and I just want to thank you for making that decision because it was a very unselfish decision, right? Um, I know because I know 
that I loved Ray with all of my heart, and he was the first man that 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 I could say that about because so many had hurt me before that. But you and I had this unbelievable special bond, and we still do, even though we we attempted to do this on Zoom earlier. We hadn't seen each other for for over 35 years. And so this is just my chance to say thank you for making that unselfish, unselfish decision. And we bring up your mom for a second. And let me just tell the world what a treasure Martha Googe was. I remember her at the time. I think they lived up in Chattanooga or somewhere like that. And and I would get packages in the mail to your house with my name. And, and Rachel and Tim and David didn't get it, but I got it. And she had gone shopping for me and bought me clothes. I can still remember what those clothes look like. And so you need to know that that legacy that your mom and dad built in you as missionaries in Anguilla, and and you have brothers from, from that island and nieces and nephews, and so it had always been in your heart to help kids like me. But I am so incredibly grateful. And so as we, as we close out here, this is a humdinger of a question, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, this is going to be for me more than anybody else. And so it is my 50th birthday. You were one of five that I chose to be on the podcast for my birthday. And so I would just like to give you a couple minutes to say anything that you would like to say as it pertains to me and, you know, wish me a happy birthday. Well, Amy, I totally agree with you. There were, you had some really serious um, medical issues. And there were times after I, we let you go to the children's home, I worried that you were going to get what you needed, if you were going to get the medical help you needed. I should have trusted them, but I didn't because in my heart, I'm a mother, Mm -hmm. but I'm grateful that you are making your 50th birthday. Yes. And I want to say happy, happy birthday. May it be blessed and may it be special and may it be exciting and may God bless you so strong and so much you have a story that can impact and help so many and i am so grateful that you are using that story not for the negative you focus on the positive and i am so grateful for you telling the story in that way because so many just Focus on the negative instead of the positive, and you are choosing to focus on the positive of what God can and will and does do. We can see it in you. I have to admit, I didn't agree with every decision you made, but you know what? I had given you to the Lord when I first got you, and so I had to trust him that he was going to continue to work. I'm proud of you. And the direction God has taken you. And I pray that this birthday will be one of the best you've ever had. Though I believe with all my heart, the ones we have in heaven will be even better. Yeah, I can't, I can't disagree with you there. Well, you said my three, you said my three favorite words and those are, I'm proud of you. And so I want you to know that you guys. I am proud of you. I am proud of you. Yeah, I'm just going to let God that breathe. bless you and keep you and increase you and strengthen you and give you wisdom and courage and love. I love you. I love you so much, Gail. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for your investment in my life. You need to know that, as I mentioned in the beginning of the, the podcast, which you, this part you didn't hear, but... The scripture that is in all four Gospels where Jesus tells the, the parable of the sower. Some people plant, some people, some people cultivate, and some people are able to reap. Well, I want you to know that the Wednesdays with Watson podcast, every word I've ever written, every time I've gotten behind a microphone at a church or somewhere, would not be possible without the investment of you and Ray and the ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, and Victory Christian Academy in Jacksonville, Florida, and I could name 50 people from that church and that school who are the reason why I am still here today. So thank you for being here with us today. I love you, and um, I can't wait to see you in February. Okay, I can't wait either. I've always loved mountain air. 
There's something about it that promotes clear thoughts. The air is grounding and the weather in the spring perfect. It was on one of those days I found myself sitting on the top step of a massive outdoor staircase in Front Royal, Virginia at a church. I had sunglasses on this so that she couldn't see my tears. But she merely listened, as for the first time ever I articulated some of the horrors of the first 15 years of my life. Mama Gallon created space in my heart the very first day I became a resident of Faith Children's Home in Tampa, Florida. And I've told that story on this podcast before about how she was the, one of the first people who ever told me that they loved me. And that's a really cool story. So hopefully you can catch that somewhere on another podcast. But she and Dad McGowan had founded the Children's Home before I was even born. At that point, they were no longer part of the day-to-day -day operations at the Children's Home but they still traveled with us and we visited supporting churches. It was those times that she would lend an ear, give me sound advice, write me pink notes, pink notes whose words reflected sowing of the seeds planted by Rick and Sharon, continued cultivation by Gail and Ray. Mama Gallon also planted more seeds, seeds of truth that were on time. They would have fallen on lethal soil before this time in my life. I've always had a special bond with Mom McGowan. Today, she and Dad McGowan are living their lives still in, in the Tampa Bay area, and I hope that they are embellishing in the fruit of the harvest of their work. This podcast is one of those fruits. Today, in a rare interview appearance, is Mom McGowan, and I get to spend just a few minutes with her, and you guys get to hear what I got to hear and the wisdom that I got to sit under for eight years while I was at the children's home. So let's drop into this conversation with Mom McGowan. Okay, guys, I hope that you are enjoying these conversations and a little walk down memory lane as Sharon and Rick Reynolds planted that seed, took me to church, and uh, had Sunday afternoon dinners with me and really just served a role in my life before Gail and Ray Dunning picked up that stick and that baton and kept me in their home for 18 months. And now I am so honored to bring to the microphone and a rare, rare interview appearance. I'm not sure that she would do this for many people, but she has agreed to do it for me here on my 50th birthday. One of the people that is absolutely responsible for my being alive, you heard me tell just one of many stories that I could have told in the introduction about how Mom McGowan has just stood in gaps and stood in gaps and stood in gaps for me since I was 14 years old. And so, Mom, I would just love to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Well, you're very welcome. I am incredibly, incredibly grateful. I know the rarity of being able to grab you. And so we'll just jump right in. I know that it has been a long, long time, but I am very, very curious. This has been a really fun question for me to ask. What are some of your earliest memories of me? Well, it has been a long time. But it is a day, Amy, I will always have in my memory for when I walked into the kitchen and I looked over and there was a girl, 14 years old, over in a little corner by the refrigerator. And as I looked at her, I thought, she's saying in her heart, I'm here. And I looked over to your eyes and I saw so much hurt, what you had been through and no words can put what came out of your eyes and what bond instantly I felt in my heart towards you. And I just prayed then before I even walked over to you, I prayed, oh, dear Jesus, let give us the wisdom to show her Jesus's love, not only that, but people that love her and let us be real to her. And so then I walked over to you, and I leaned over, and you looked at me funny, and I said, let me ask you a question. Has anyone told you today that they love you? And honestly, I don't remember your response. I think you just looked at me. I did. But I felt that for her. So as I look back, I just have so much thankfulness in my heart for what God has done in your life, and he gets all the glory. 
He does get all the glory, and you guys taught me that. You really did, and I remember that day, and it's been well documented on the podcast, and I did. I just looked at you because I thought, I mean, you had such a Southern accent as my listeners are hearing, (laughs) but I started the podcast, and this is going to be my gift to you when the episode actually drops, but I told the story about when we were at a church in Front Royal, Virginia, I will never forget Mm -hmm. it, and there were a ton of stairs, and you and I sat at the top of the stairs as we waited to get ready for the service. And for the first time in my life, to anybody, I told you some of the things that had happened to me in great detail. Gail was on the podcast earlier, and she said I never would tell them any details. And so I'm just wondering, as an adult, I can't even imagine some kid coming to me telling me everything that I told you. Do you remember your thoughts on that day and in that moment? Yes. Oh, I remember that day very clearly. We had to come early back to the church that day, which we didn't always do. But I guess some of the kids had, the people had to go to work or something, then they left them at the church. And you happened to be one that was there. And so we went up to the, like you said, the top step. And I looked at you and we just, for a few minutes, just sort of, uh, exchange things and all, but then by this time you and I had formed a relationship, but I know there was so much hurt down in your heart. There was a past that you felt you could or would never share. As I listened to you, Amy, my heart was hurting for you. As we sat there on those steps, you slowly began to share those awful things that was in your past from the day we formed a special bond as I listened to you. And the feeling that I have was hurting for you, but God put a a love in my heart instantly, and that was the bond for you. And as you deal with people, you're going to have that, but it doesn't come with everyone. But you will have experiences like that, and you were one. You were one of them. Well, <laughs> thank you. And I knew that God knew that I needed that. I had never been able to call anyone mom before. I will never forget. You know, you wrote me pink notes after pink notes, and listeners that are listening in the children's home, everything was donated, and somebody had donated sheets and sheets of pink paper, and mom would write me letters or little notes. And I still have all of those to this day, and there was a special bond. And I just want to thank you, mom, on this podcast for listening to me that day, because I believe that that was the day that started so much healing because you listened to me. We were at that church because because we traveled and sang, and you and Dad, and this is something that I've always wanted to know. So by the time I got to the children's home, I got there in 1987, so the children's home had just celebrated at least the one in Tampa, like their 20th anniversary. But you and Dad, like Dad was a had a full career in the military, and, and you had two children, uh, Linda and Cindy, who I love. Shout out to them. They will be listening to this. I love them. Both of them also are a reason why I am doing what I am doing today. But what spurred you guys to start? a a children's home in your 40s, basically. Well, let me back up just for a minute about those steps, then we'll continue. Mm -hmm. The Lord gave me the verse, He healed us of brokenhearted and bind us up their wounds. And Amy, that is just what God did for you that day, slowly, one at a time. So true. So true. And he wasn't done, right? You you guys walked through me. I mean, I have you in one decade, but you've been in... Four of them, including when I was going through the domestic violence, and you were right yes. that 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 is such a precious verse. But it really was, you know, my getting out of that and my healing is so rooted in the children's home and Dad McGowan and you and the pink notes and Dad saying, "Stay in church, stay on your knees, stay in the Word," of which I didn't do and made mistakes. But do you remember what the Lord just called you guys to to help kids? Did something happen to yes. spur that on? Well, we lived in Covington, Indiana, and, of course, we had a good church there. We were there 10 years, and we, Dad did a lot of things. He was the choir director, the music director, and he was a deacon and much more, and we held Bible clubs and for the fifth and sixth graders and then for some of the older children. We had them in the yard, 
they would come and we would just teach them God's word. And this is something you would never remember because that is ancient. We did fl- flannel boards for sh- you showed the children on the flannel board. The <laughs> I actually kind of do remember that. Yeah. Yes, we, we did that. And then the word, as dad says, you get all your answers from the word, just different things, different verses were just coming to us and coming to us. And the main verse was, in John where it says, so send I you. Mm. Well, I couldn't, and Dad couldn't get that verse out of our heads. And at that time, he was doing a missionary cantata with the choir there. And the name of the cantata was, so send I you. Wow. So we really and truly took that as, okay, Lord, we're going to obey. We don't know what's out there. We don't know what you want us to do, but we're we're here and we'll do whatever it is you want us to do or wherever you want to send us. And that's how it all began. Wow. I had actually never heard that part of the story. And so for those of you who don't know about the children's home quickly, they started their first children's home in Melbourne, Florida children's home and uh, had three children's homes ultimately before dad retired completely by faith. Uh, never bought anything. Everything was donated. I learned so many mom, so many of my friends, mom, referred to me as as a prayer warrior and I learned that from you guys from the children's home learning that all things happen on our knees and boy when I have veered from that I have paid for it dearly but it reminds me of that verse in Isaiah 6 verse 9 which I believe is true about my life where the the Lord says who will ascend and who will go for me and then the prophet Isaiah says then said I here am I send me and that is the prayer of my heart as I go out and I minister and as you mentioned you know there will be those times when I will bond with people that I'm helping and I have done that I've really experienced that but one of the reasons why I really wanted you here on my 50th birthday is because you you are teaching me to carry your torch I want to take it from you and I want to carry the torch to help people and obey the call to go to the Amy's in the middle of a, a cabinet and a refrigerator you, and follow the prompting of the Lord. And so I guess that's kind of my question to you is for those out there listening who are like, I want to make that kind of difference in the lives of people. You obey that call. The obedience of that call for the Lord to send you is the reason why on December the 1st, 2021, on this day that this podcast is being broadcast, that I'm celebrating a fifth, my 50th birthday because you answered that call because dad answered that call. But there are people out there wondering, how do I know? How do I know when I should help and when I shouldn't? Do you have any advice for people that want to invest in the lives of those around us like yes. you did me? Yes, I do. First of all, you, you said that you surrendered to, to your calling that you took from me. And I, I, I'm glad you said that, Amy. It makes encourages me and that makes me even know more so how to pray for you i know that god is using you greatly and will continue but there's days too amy that you get weary and discouraged but the person that you're dealing with no matter who just love that person love does so much for them and they can tell amy yes and you know this because you were on the other side if it's real or not amen we have a lot of people that go on but i love you i love you but you can tell so let that person give your heart to that heart of the one you're trying to reach and they will know that you are real and not just someone there to to talk to or try to get you better or, or whatever And stay, as Dad says, stay in the Word as you read His Word and glean from it. The person you're dealing with that day, God always gives a verse before you start to talk from your devotion that morning or sometimes just that still, small voice in your ear. And that helped me more than anything. And these children, just like you know, are desperate for someone to care and to love them, and they, it's what you're there to do. That's through the problems and all, but you have to first bond that love and ask God to sh- give that love from your heart to the person that you're helping. And sometimes, Amy, they don't respond. We know that. Yeah. Not everyone is a success story, but that doesn't change the fact you're still supposed to do what God has called you to do with that person. It's up to them to accept or to reject. 
But the encouraging part, I'll share a story with you. Well, not more than just one, maybe. But we had this young man, and we just ministered, especially Dad, ministered and ministered this boy. And when he left, we both just said, oh, what a loss, what a loss. So he, we hadn't heard from him in years. And then one of our reunions that we had, this man came up to me, and he said, you don't know who I am, do you? And I looked at him, and I said, well, I do and I don't, but the one that I was thinking would never be here today. And he said, well, it is me. Wow. And he told me his name. And I, said, he, I looked at him, and I said, oh, my goodness, prayers been answered. I would never in a hundred years believe that you took in anything that we taught you. He said, I didn't for years. It was there, but I didn't. I didn't listen to it. I did my own thing alone. And then gradually some things happened in my life. And I, I look back at the children's home and I look back at what you all, and not just as a staff and all, taught me. And he said, I said, I'm going to go and let them know. And I want to thank you. So Amy, when you look at the most discouraging one that you're trying to help, don't give up. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Even if that person rejects you, you may not ever, you may know later, they may contact you, but we don't know the others that that remembered and obeyed God that we never know about, but that's okay. God knows, and it's that is what keeps you going, and I want to share something with you about what makes you keep you going. This is from my heart to your heart. I had discouraging days, too, at the home, and you were the one that helped me through discouraging days because I looked at you and I saw real commitment and real love. I mean, not every day did it pop out on you, but basically, and I, as I said, we had a bond. And when I was discouraged, you were the encourager to me. You never knew that, but no, you I were. Didn't. I, well, I didn't know that, but it was modeled for me well with you. No, I didn't know that. But, you know, looking through the lens of an adult now, I see, I'm really kind of speechless. I'm so grateful to have what you just said to me on audio because it's just so precious to my heart. And you and dad always used to say, and, and this was so ingrained in my mind is when you talked about ministry, if one person, if one child makes it out of here, and carries on the gospel and heals and does things, it will be all worth it. I hope, Mama, I don't hope, I know that I'm, a, I'm one of those ones, but it, to hear that I as a child encouraged you to keep going is so, is the best birthday gift that you could possibly, possibly give me. And so I just want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for being here on, for my birthday celebration. I, I will always treasure this. I will always treasure my time at the children's home. And I think that what you've given to people that will listen to this podcast is just an encouraging word into my heart. I had no idea, Mom. You know, we, you know you've walked with me through four of the five decades that I have been alive and you have walked with me through some dark times of the domestic violence that we've talked about on here and i know that that must have been scary and 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 discouraging and all the things for you but you never gave up on me you you and dad drove to jacksonville when i had major surgeries and you just never given up on me and so it wasn't like i left the children's home when i graduated from college and you guys just said hey good luck with that and so you never gave up on me and in those darkest hours i always remembered something that you said to me and it, and it was taught and it talked about bitterness and resentment and anger and you taught us and you would point and I'm pointing to my heart what's in here comes out here and I'm and I'm pointing to my face and so it's because of you that I can get behind the microphones and and keyboards and podiums at churches and stuff like that it is because of Faith Children's Home and you and the call but I am so grateful to be at least one of the ones that I hope made that ministry worth it for you guys well, let me say this too, Amy. As we look at you, we just thank the Lord for you and for what you're, you're doing. It just makes our heart warm and just thank and thank Jesus that you truly are spreading the gospel and helping hundreds and hundreds of hurting 
people, and they know it's real. But I have to tell you this as you close. Dad said to tell you that you were his encourager every time he needed a sip of water. <laughs> there it was sitting on the pool. Oh, my God, that means the world to me. Yeah, he called me his cupbearer, and Dad was... Yes, it did. Dad, Dad was one of the ones that I was not afraid of, and and um, he had me get him those cups of water to put on the pulpit because he knew that I that he needed to find a way to connect with me. Well, Mom, I have taken the baton from you. You may rest. No, you're... Tell Dad he may well, rest. Excuse me, Amy. You know what I do of a morning. I don't know if there's, your church uses this song, but it's, I'll just say the words because you know I can't sing. <laughs> Every morning, it, in the morning. When I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. And you know what? You know what other song that I would I would sing if I could, but I can't, so I won't. But thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Yes, yes. You've given me a you've given me a family, a fine family, is what we used to sing. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. And Mom, thank you for being here. And like I said, you may rest. I have the baton. And I hope that people behind me will take the baton from me. But we will never stop standing up in a world, in a dark world. Even if I have to stand alone, I will never stop fighting for hurting people just like you didn't. I want you to rest, Mom. I want Dad to rest. We got it from here. And I got one last question for you, Mom McGowan. Has anybody told you today? Yes, they have, Dad McGowan. But I've had, and I haven't heard it from you, but I just did. Well, and you don't know, know what joy that brings to my heart. Well, I love you, and we got it from here. I want you to rest in knowing that all of that work, all of the toiling, some of the seeds that you planted for some of the kids did land on deaf ears, but somebody cultivated that late, later. But this podcast is a cultivation of the seeds that you planted in my life at 15 years old. That's a long time ago. It's 30 years ago. And, and or no, 35 years ago. Uh, 35 years ago, you planted that seed. And so I just want to thank you so much. And as, as we end here, um, I just please tell Dad that I love him. And I want both of you to give me the baton. I will give it to others. We got it from here. Well, here it is, Amy. You have it. I love you so much, Mom. Thank you for being here today. I love you so much and so proud of looking at you and what a godly, wonderful lady of God that you are. Well, thank you, Mom. It doesn't happen without you. I love you so much. Thank you for being here. I love you, honey. I stood in the Dana Women's office. I fully expected to walk out of that office dismissed from Clearwater Christian College. I was deep in the throes of grief and confusion. We had only flipped the calendar two times between that day in Mrs. Grubb's office and the day that my sister and I had to make the decision to take my mom off of life support. I was only 19 years old. I had no concept of how to grieve the loss of a mom who never was a mom. Mrs. Grubb's office was on the third floor overlooking the Gulf of Mexico. I barely heard her come into the office. She had a reputation for being tough, so I was fully prepared to be dismissed from college. Had that happened, I don't believe I'd be here today celebrating my 50th birthday. Of all the words spoken that day, I only remember this sentence that she said. If you attend counseling with one of our residence advisors once a week for the rest of the year, you may stay under strict probation. I'd like to fast forward 20 years, and Chris and I stood on a St. Augustine beach on a cold, windy day. She not only saved my college career, but she remained a steadfast friend, one of 20 people at my wedding, and on that day, standing on the beach, she slipped back into counselor mode. I had not told anyone about what was going on at home or the copious amounts of pain pills I was taking, but she knew something was up. She promised her prayers, and I knew I had them, along with her unconditional love. When I did leave that domestic violence marriage, I moved back to my college town, in large part because Chris was still there. When I landed a job teaching, she bought me an alarm clock. When I had a nervous breakdown and was hospitalized, she was there. When I had to go to court to get restraining orders, she was there. When I'm feeling unrest, I remember a verse that she taught me on walks in Philippi Park and lunches at Taco Bell, Isaiah 26.3. I will keep him in perfect peace. Because his mind is stayed on thee, 
because he trusts in thee. When our alma mater closed after 50 years in 2015, she and I shared a stage as we paid homage to the place that built us. Today, over 30 years later, Chris, or some people call her Dr. Witt, not me, is still a 2 a.m. friend. I will always mention her name when I tell my story, and I am so grateful to have her here today. I love, love, love for you to drop into this conversation with my friend, Chris DeWitt. Well, guys, we have made it to the part of the podcast episode next to last. Everyone's been talking about that toe-headed kid. Well, that toe-headed kid grew up and graduated from high school and went to Clearwater Christian College. Shout out, we are Clearwater, on a full ride scholarship. You heard how I met Chris DeWitt and the story that I just told you. And so, Chris, welcome to the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. It's so, so amazing to have you here. Thank you, Amy. It's a privilege to be with you today. So, I don't know, you know, 50 used to seem really old, but as I prayed for us right before the podcast, I realized that you have been involved in three of the decades of my life. That does seem like, wow, that is crazy. I am so grateful. So I met you, as the listeners heard, when I was in college. And so I know it has been a long, 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 long time, but I'm asking everyone this, and it's been, the answers have been so much fun. But what are some of your earliest memories or your interactions that you have of me? Oh, Amy, I picture you on the campus of Clearwater Christian College like it was yesterday. My memory is not of you as a college student, mm. but as a child singing with all the beautiful children in your matching outfits from Faith Children's Home. <sighs> you stood out. You were a shining star with your huge smile and your outgoing personality. And I can still picture you singing little as much when God is in it. <laughs> oh, my word. I forgot we sang at, at Clearwater. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Year after year. And I spotted you. And then I do remember meeting you as you first began classes at Clearwater Christian College. You were one of the first kids from Faith Children's Home to get a full ride scholarship to attend Clearwater. When I first talked to you, you seemed so excited for the opportunity to attend college Yet at the same time, you appeared a bit overwhelmed, frightened, and may I say a little apprehensive. But oh my, all of that quickly changed as you spread your wings, you expanded your community, and you enjoyed college life. Wow. I, wow. I loved my time at Clearwater Christian College. And as as some of the listeners will know, and of course, and, and by the way, listeners, Chris, who I am talking to is also a CCC alum class of 1987. Correct. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's impressive, Watson. I have to say so it myself. Very impressive. But yeah, that's so funny. Little as much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. Oh, wow. I remember singing that. We digress. So I had forgotten that we sang there, but I, you know, yeah, was standing in the front row with my hair jacked to Jesus and probably permed and blonde. Well, some of my most precious memories of you, so I'm going to flip the switch for a second, were walks at Philippi Park. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you did it on the Clearwater Christian College salary, but you took a bunch of us to Taco Bell all the time. I don't even like Taco Bell, but I loved it with you. Then it, then I moved on to campus and was a proctor, and so we had proctor meetings in your apartment. But probably one of the most impactful things, memories I have of you early on, is that you you had created a grief share group because that semester, for some reason, so many students had lost people. And to this day, some of my closest friends I met in that group, two of whom will be at my 50th birthday party, and that, we, we've remained friends th this th all this time. And so... so yeah, it really is. And I and, and you never did that group again. And we met in your in your in your apartment on a Monday night and we processed through our grief. Well, and you kind of mentioned it a minute ago when I got to Clearwater Christian College, I spread my wings and got community. I am super outgoing, although that some of that guests earlier today from when I was early childhood said how shy I was, which nobody believes me, but it really is true. <laughs> side <laughs> not seen that side in 30 years but a huge component of this podcast is community so clearly that's been important to me my whole life and that is what you gave me as the listeners heard just after my mom died you are and just a, 
lots of we've got lots of Clearwater Christian College uh, alumni that listen to the podcast. And so there's this big joke among the people that were there among that time is you were Chris at that time. That's what we called you, Chris. And then we were supposed to call you Miss DeWitt, which I never did. Hard. That was yeah, that was hard. And now fast forward a whole bunch of years, you are Dr. Kristen DeWitt, a, a professor at Cedarville University. And so but this question I'm asking as your friend. So it's it, I know it's going to be difficult not for you to, to answer me professionally, but what spurs you to help kids like me and building that community? Because you are still doing it today at Cedarville, 30 years later. Why is that so important to you and to anybody who feels called to do it? Oh, it's such a privilege. The Lord has been so gracious to me just to allow me to cross paths with so many people in my lifetime. I've met people that really are on the same path I am on, a path toward Christ likeness. Um, For some people, this path has been filled with potholes and bumps and loss and loneliness, hurts and detours. Yet each person, each person has a story. And I've always wanted to hear the stories behind each face. Because behind each face is a redemptive story that only God can write. And if God in his sovereignty allows me to be a small part of someone's story, I'm totally thrilled. I've never really met anyone with wealth or fame, but I have met precious people more important than rich and famous people. I've met people who are chosen, bought with a price, Mm -hmm. forgiven, redeemed, treasured, and eternally loved. I've met people for whom God is writing a beautiful, redemptive story. You are going to make me cry for real, because I, yeah, And, and, and so listeners out there, what she just said is like, be a part of the story that God is telling. And so, yeah, I can imagine, Chris, over the the 30 plus years that because you essentially graduated from Clearwater Christian College and almost immediately got your, you know, started transitioning into getting your master's degree from Liberty University. And as I mentioned since then, you know, you've earned a PhD as and, and, and are now a professor at Cedarville University as unfortunately our alma mater closed after 50 years in 2015. But I never thought of it that way, like how it must be like to be you to, to, to all the Amy Watsons out there, or as you first knew me, Amy Bodenheimer's out there, that that you've been able to speak into their lives, shine Jesus more than anything, because that's all you've ever done for me. You've always pointed me, me to him. You've never judged me. And so that coupled with the, your decision to continue to pursue a PhD in psychology why is mental health in general so important to you as a Christian and as just a human? Yeah, that's a good question. Emotional and mental health affects our lives in so many ways. It impacts our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors, our relationships. And I think, unfortunately, mental health is often a topic that gets stigmatized, especially in Christian circles. And our mental health affects how we cope with everything else. And if individuals don't get the help they need, their life can quickly unravel and they can find themselves in an uncontrollable downward spiral. So when people are brave enough to ask for help and seek treatment, they can learn to cope again. And before they know it, they can hope again. Mm. So we, we should value mental health and wellness as much as we value anything else. Louder for the people in the back, seriously. And so guys, I have brought Chris on because she is one of my closest friends and has been involved in my life, as you heard in the story that I told you since I was a sophomore in college. But this is a professional talking about the importance of mental health. And I loved, Chris, what you just said there. So for anybody that is brave enough to seek help, and I've gotten a bit of a passion for mental health because I can I see what can happen when we couple counseling and therapy and for some of the higher acuity things, uh, medication. But when those things are the on the periphery, and but it's a gospel centered approach in the middle, Mm -hmm. then, Mm -hmm. then that bravery is met with such hope. And there are still things that I struggle with, as you know, but such hope. Thank you for saying that both as my friend and from a professional level, because this is what you do. This is what you teach. You're teaching Christian college students to go out into the world and do what you just said. And so it makes my heart so happy to hear that 
long after we are both gone, hopefully the work that you did at Clearwater Christian College with not only me, but hundreds of other people. I've never seen anybody get so many friends on Facebook than when you got on Facebook <laughs> because of your investment in the lives of people. But there's still people that will go it alone. And so for those out there considering going it alone, you watched me do this. I remember one time you came to St. Augustine you got in your car and you came to St. Augustine. I remember it was cold because we were standing on the beach and I was mm -hmm. deep, 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 deep in the throes of that domestic violence marriage. And I had not told a single soul. I was also addicted to pain medication, had not told a single soul. You don't know this, but you probably saved my life with that trip because of what you said up in the community part is that, and, and the counseling part, you gave me some hope and it's a little bit of time before I'd got that help and before I got out of that marriage. But I look at that day on the beach as a linchpin in my healing. But, but for people that don't have a crystal wit, but are in the throes of darkness, like I was, what do you have to say to them to give them hope so that they can cope so that they too can have a Joel 225 story. And this is a Joel 225 day, this one right here, though my story is not complete. How can other people have stories of redemption? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, yet in addition to getting professional help, we all need to run to Christ. Yes. For it's in Christ alone that we can find peace. When our, our lives seem frazzled and our hearts are restless, we need to stay focused on Christ. Because when our, mind, our minds remain on Christ... He'll fill us with his unimaginable peace, Isaiah 26, 3. <laughs> oh, when we feel rejected and lonely, and we all do, and our hearts sting with pain as it seems no one cares or no one even notices, that's when we need to cling to Christ, realizing that nothing can separate us from his everlasting love, Romans 8, 38 and 39. When thunderbolts of regret ignite and threaten to consume us, we need to run to Christ for it's only then that we can experience the downpours of his forgiveness and grace. Lamentations 3, 23. And when the burden of our hearts just are so heavy that it consumes our thoughts and depletes our energy, that's, that's when we need to rest in Christ, knowing he will comfort and sustain us. Psalm 55, 22. So bottom line is run to Christ. That is where you'll find peace. That is where you'll find hope. Yeah, and I could not agree with you more. I We call him the star of the story on this podcast because he is. He is the star of all of it. And so listeners out there, you don't have to go it alone. Find, you know, the three C's on this podcast are church, community, counseling, and, and then highlighting the star of the story who Chris just beautifully outlined as Jesus. He is the answer. And even if you don't have a Chris DeWitt in your life who will stand on the beach with you, probably knowing what was going on, but it was so smart enough to not say anything about it at the time. People want to help, but paramount to that, I would just recommend to people, and Chris, I think you would agree, if you're seeking help, you're seeking community for, for really for anything, but it, particularly for emotional pain, trauma, please make sure that you put yourself under the the eyes and ears and love and protection and prayers of somebody who understands that it has to be Jesus and Jesus alone and Christ alone only. I know that I am so grateful to have the opportunity to be that in the lives of some people because you don't get to be 50 without making some effect on somebody's life, but you, we get to choose what effect we, we get. And I've made some poor decisions, but Chris, you've been there with me through thick and thin I know your heart just must be so happy when you think about what you saw that day on that beach in St. Augustine. I don't know if you remember that day as well as I do, but it was the day I forgot that you, you defended your dissertation that I asked you that question. But for those of you out there listening, there is hope. And because of that hope, there is, there is a way to cope. And if that includes all the things and including, or in addition to, I should say, uh, highlighting the story of the story, including medication. As Chris said, we need to stop stigmatizing it. Uh, we live in a fallen, broken world where trauma is going to happen. And so mm -hmm. so that that's just a little encouragement to those of you out there who are lonely or may not have a Chris DeWitt or 
even five people like I did on this podcast where I where people just love me. And so speaking of loving me as we close it is my birthday and I don't give Happy birthday. Thank you. And I don't give my mic away very easily. I keep but I do keep telling people that I will cherish this audio. You are bringing up the rears for me as Chrissy is after you but I've already recorded hers and so it's my birthday and I would love to just pass the mic to you and any message that you might have for me. Thank you. Yes, and happy birthday, Amy. Thank you. When I think when I think of you and personal characteristics that you have, here are a few thoughts that come to mind. I just love that you are affable. You're good natured. Your listeners probably already have figured that out by listening to you. You're friendly. You're so easy to talk to so that everyone is comfortable in your presence. You you are the real deal. You are just so genuine. Appreciate that. I also like your good sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You and I have undoubtedly enjoyed some good gut laughs together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm amazed at your hardworking diligence. I know you will never settle for anything less than your best. And especially when it comes to your walk with the Lord, you're never content with your spiritual journey. And Christ is certainly magnified in your life. In addition to fun times we've had, I had a close-up view of a person, Amy, who has endured trauma and suffering. I would like to just give you, Amy, a glimpse of what I have seen as the storm of suffering has swept over your life. Whether it was the grievous abuse you suffered as a child or the domestic violence you endured as an adult, you, Amy, you have used those circumstances as a platform to exalt Jesus. Suffering has not only been an opportunity to privately place your dependence on the Lord, but suffering has also seemed to be the pressure that pushes the character of Christ to the forefront of your life. So others will clearly see Christ in you. I've had a very precious, oh, special time when I can sit back and quietly watch you as your life has been put on display, as if you were in the front window at Macy's for all the passerbyers to see. And those passing by see a gleaming showcase in which to view the precious gems of God's character that are reflected in you, Amy. Just as a diamond seeks to sparkle more brilliantly when displayed in a black velvet case, so the radiant beauty of Christ-like character seems to shine in you more splendidly against the backdrop of suffering. Thank you, Amy, for being a shining example of God's faithfulness in the midst of the storms of life. So, Amy... There's nothing, no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that even can touch you until it has first gone past God and past Christ, right through to you, passing through the one who loves you most. And if it has come that far, it has come with great purpose. It surely has been a process, but I'm confident that you have now found the purpose for your pain. So thanks, Amy, for sharing your story behind the face, or shall I say, behind the microphone. <laughs> Thank you for always making much of Christ through your life circumstances. God is faithful. We can trust him. Don't ever forget that. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Happy birthday, my dear friend. I love you dearly. Oh, my gosh. You guys are killing me today. Oh, thank you so much for that. I will always treasure that. And I just love you so much. And um, I love you, too. And you are the reason why I can get behind this microphone, one of many. But thank you so much for being here with us today, Chris. Thank you. It's a privilege. Okay, guys, we have moved to the last person who really has now been in my life as of today when you're listening to this. And actually, gosh, Chrissy, you're getting ready to be in three decades of my life. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Obviously, everyone knew that for, for the last uh, decade, I was going to pick Chrissy Lothridge. And um, there aren't words for me to say how grateful I am. So Chrissy, thank you for coming on to this episode. I am not yet 50 as we're recording this, but <laughs> on the day that it's recorded, it will be my 50th birthday. And you, you came to me and said, I have something. So can we do something a little bit different? So everyone else kind of got a pre story of how we met and, and I was able to give them the creative gift of a story, but I give you plenty of gifts. You don't need anymore. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. So today, 
Well, listeners are listening to me. It's my 50th birthday. And the old English poem goes that Wednesday's child is full of woe. And while it might seem true about my life, that is not true of particularly the last 13, 14 years of which you've been part of it. And so I would just love to know uh, what you would love the listeners to hear, anything that you would like for me to hear. And I am terrified. So (laughs) let's go. (laughs) Don't be terrified. (laughs) Um, so what, what had really been impressed on my heart recently is I've been listening to Shane and Shane's hymns, uh, album and particularly the hymn, his mercy is more. So it, the, the kind of key chorus line is our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. And it's sort of a jingly tune. And, and so it, it sort of, it's, it's a little bit of an earworm. And so it stays in my head all the time. And so as I'm bumping into life, a lot of times his mercy is more keeps coming, just coming to mind. And, and I think you and I were talking about, uh, mom and, and I, and I started to think about, you know, I don't know that our childhoods could be any different. Mm -hmm. In, in every way, I don't, I don't need to go through everything that has ever happened to you, but, but really night and day different. And the only overlapping piece, major overlapping piece is God. Mm-hmm. And so I, I started to see in my mind and, and the Lord just impressed on me, he is more. He, yes, his mercy is more for our sins, but his grace is more. His love is more. And, and I started to sort of change the lyrics to the song. It, it, our, your scars, they are many. His healing is more. Uh, our hurts, they are many. His love, it is more. And it, it just, I just kept thinking, it, it doesn't matter how bad Satan works to make your life broken and beat up. He is more. Satan never wins. And so both for you, Amy, and for those out there thinking, I'm too broken, he is more. His mercy is more. His grace is more. His love is more. His healing is more. His joy is more than the greatest sorrow. His justice is more. He he is more. And so, again, if you can download the song, it's kind of a fun thing to change the lyrics out whatever it is our sins they are many his mercy is more our hurts they are many his love it is more our pain it is great his his love it is more he's just more and there's never there's never a day that goes by that i don't recognize what we've been through in the past 14 15 years easily anyone looking in at any point could call time out i give up it's too much but he's more he's more he's more he's more and i want i want listeners to hear that but i want you to hear that amy on on our worst days on our best days he's more he's more than whatever we're going through and i need that I need to know that every day. I know you need to know that too. No matter what, he is more. And he loves us more than, than anything. And I'm, I'm so, so grateful. I'm grateful for you. And I'm grateful for a God who is more. Because we face really hard things every day. Sorry. <laughs> I knew you were going to make me cry. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't think that I would make it to 40. I certainly didn't know that I would make it to 50, but what a perfect way to end this podcast as some of the most special people to me in my life. And the reason why I'm able to sit behind this mic have been on this podcast today. And all of you have done life with me so closely and maybe sometimes look at me and say, how, how can she still be and fill in the blank breathing air And I don't know that there's a better way to end a birthday podcast celebrating a half century on this planet. Holy cow. And that he has always been enough. So, Chrissy, thank you for 
for coming on here and for celebrating with me. And I know you're you're not big on birthdays, but I've made a big deal of this one. And but it could you couldn't have summed up my 50 years of life anymore. And I love that Shane and Shane song. And it is kind of catchy. And now it's in my head. The uh, another song on that album is I will wait for you. I will wait for you. And and I'm so grateful for the people that have been on this podcast and for 50 more that I could have asked to be on this podcast that have come to celebrate with us today. But Chrissy, what you just said just kind of sums it all up. He is more. He's not enough. He is more. And so as I end the podcast, I literally want to read the lyrics to the song by Nicole Nordeman called I Am. And as I celebrate my 50 years of life, this has been true about my God. And so I will not end this podcast the way I normally will. I'm going to read the lyrics to this song. And then after that, we will just fade off into the next thing. But this has been my God. This has been the God that Chrissy has just explained to you. The God who is not enough, the God who is more, more than all of it. And so Nicole, Nicole Nordeman writes a song that just walks, uh, walks through the faithfulness of God and the life of p- human beings, people. But this song has always been special to me and has always resonated with, with me. And so I'd love to share the lyrics if you would so um, indulge me on my 50th birthday. Pencil marks on a wall. I wasn't always this tall. You scattered some monsters from beneath my bed. You watched my team win. You watched my team lose. You watched when my bicycle went down again. And when I was weak, unable to speak, so I could call you by name. And I said, elbow healer, superhero, come if you can. You said, I am. Only 16, life is so mean. What kind of curfew is at 10 p.m.? You saw my mistakes and watched my heart break, heard when I swore I'd never love again. And when I was weak, unable to speak, so I could call you by name, and I said, heartache healer, secret keeper, be my best friend, and you said, I am. You saw me wear white, By pale candlelight as I set forever to what lies ahead. Two kids in a dream with kids that can scream. Too much it might seem when it's 2 a.m. And when I am weak, unable to speak, still I will call you by name. Shepherd, Savior, Pastor Maker, hold on to my hand. You said I am. The winds of change and circumstance blow in and all around us. So we find a foothold that's familiar and bless the moments that we feel you nearer. When life had begun, I was woven and spun and you let the angels dance around the throne. And who can say when, but they'll dance again when I am free and finally headed home. I will be weak, unable to speak, still I will call you by name, creator, maker, life sustainer, comforter, healer, my redeemer, Lord and King, beginning and the end, I am. Yes, I am. Thank you, Jesus, for being more. Hey guys, so a special surprise. I have Dr. Thomas Pettit here and my question to Dr. Pettit is, uh, who I have been in counseling with since 2008, Dr. Pettit, what is your very first memory of me? The, the word that comes to mind is the word together. You were surprisingly together. You were cool, calm, collected, confident, and it didn't seem to match what I was aware of or hearing for the first time that you had been through. And I, and I was more struck by there was somehow something very real and very genuine about that togetherness. So that's my first memory. Interesting. I, yeah, I, I remember coming in and telling you everything like I was giving you directions to the bank. So, well, thank you for that. Yes. Well, well, yes. you are going to actually 
Exodus L of the podcast because you are one of the reasons why I am turning 50. And so I just wondered for, for my listeners out there, and it is my birthday. So I am just going to ask you have any special birthday celebration words, encouragement, because it's not just for me, it's for everybody else too. So I do. The word is wholeness. And that's the thread that connected the togetherness. So there, there was a mismatch of that togetherness. It was more of survival. And it was more of, uh, yeah, all that you had harnessed and harvested to make it through all that had happened to you. But the wholeness was the genuineness that you were whole then, you are whole now. And so the togetherness has given way to wholeness. Amy, you are whole. 